Hello and welcome to another segment of Western Wisconsin Journal. I'm Jamie Johnson, uh, the correspondent for politics and government, and we're heading the fall election season. And today we're kicking off our interviews at the various, for the various offices. Today, uh, for this interview, my guest is Sarah Yakub, who's running for the 30th Assembly District. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you for having me tonight. You bet. And thank you for joining us via Zoom. I would point out to our audience that I do have my mask with, but I'm the only one sitting in this room. So uh, it makes it easier to hear me uh, without the mask on. So uh, if I can call you Sarah, is that all right? Absolutely. All right. You're running uh, for the 30th as a Democrat. Is that correct? Yes. And it's not your first uh, foray into partisan politics, is it? No, um, I ran for a district attorney back in 2016. The funny part here is never in my career or uh, in parts of my adulthood did I think I want to run for office. Uh, it wasn't until uh, being invited to run for DA given my experience as a district attorney uh, and the comparative experience of others on the ballot that I ran in 2016 and then was asked to do this uh, for state assembly and initially said, oh no, <laughs> no thank you. Um, but then actually gave it some thought and you know prayed on it, talked to my family and decided, okay, let's do it. All right. Well, um, before we get into your background and your issues and motivation, um, just a refresher for our audience because the 30th assembly district is quite different than what it was when I ran uh, more than two decades ago. I ran in 96 and 98, and it was mostly Pierce County. So what, is, um, what are the boundaries now of the 30th Assembly District? Yes, uh, we are a little upside down, inverted Utah-shaped district just outside the Twin Cities. So we are Hudson and River Falls, uh, but we go all the way up to St. Joseph to the north. We go out to Roberts to the east. We go up to the town of Richmond. We don't have the city of New Richmond, but we do have the town. We have the town of Kinnikinick, uh, the town of Warren, the town of uh, North Hudson, or the village of North Hudson, I should say, um, the city of River Falls, and the town of River Falls. Okay. The town of Troy. Right. Don't forget Troy. That's right. A very little part of Pierce County, but now mostly uh, St. Croix. Correct. And so now... Let's just talk a little bit about your background, because you mentioned about running for district attorney, and you had that experience, but like, where were you born and raised, uh, what's your education, and where have you, what's your, been your work experience? Sure. Uh, my parents are PhD scientists. They thought babies and PhD dissertations were a fun combination, power to them. Uh, so we, I was born down in San Diego. That's where my parents were in grad school. Spent a little bit of time in New York during their postdocs and then predominantly grew up in the Pasadena area in Southern California. I went to law school with the career goal of becoming a deputy district attorney. And when that happened, that was essentially it. I wanted to be a DA uh, and was fortunate enough to be selected. It was something like 40 positions. We're at in something like 1,200 applicants. So it was a uh, quite the accomplishment to be selected as a WDA out of Los Angeles County. Uh, let me back up. In undergrad, I was a biopsychology major. I went to the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, where I graduated Phi Beta Kappa. And uh, yes, yeah, so moved out to Wisconsin with every intention of retiring my DA hat and raising my children and just really enjoying, enjoying life. Um, and I found that my passion for public service manifests in using my law degree. Uh, so what I've done is create a 501c3, a nonprofit that has allowed me to provide no cost legal representation to survivors of trauma and working families within the community. Essentially those who most need access to the legal community so frequently do not have access as a function of finances, uh, which leads to uh, problems and tragedies up and down the board of different scales and proportion. Uh, so I've been very blessed to be able to plug in in this way. Uh, so while I didn't come here necessarily um, with any idea that I would ever be active in politics, uh, as I've had an opportunity to work in the community, see where our legislation uh, has some holes, uh, particularly when it comes to protecting children and survivors of crime and trauma, that really, uh, inspired me to be willing to run now. 
Okay. And so you are a practicing attorney then? I am. Okay. And uh, you mentioned your children. How many do you have? Yes. So between my husband and I, we have seven. He brought three. I brought two. We made two. The factory is officially closed. Uh, we would have to get an interesting van to house everyone if we had any more kids. We do have a nine-seater SUV, so it works. Um, but yes, I have four boys, and I'm beginning to believe I am physically incapable of producing a girl. In my luck, we would have twin boys if we ever tried again. Okay. And, uh, and where do they go to school? And so the three oldest are in Hudson schools, and the, my older two are at Rocky Branch down in River Falls. And we just started our four-year-old in the Montessori 4K in River Falls. They have a, a tremendous Montessori program, and we are so grateful that we were able to get our son in. Okay, so which township or village do you live in or city? We're in the city of Hudson. City of Hudson. All right. Thanks for clarifying that. I just worried because we were talking about the 30th Assembly District and, um, you know, you, you, you uh, anyway, you clarify that. Thank you. You mentioned your motivation for running. What do you see as um, the big issues for the 30th Assembly District? And uh, why are you running against a popular incumbent? Uh, we'll have to agree to disagree as to popularity, but, um, you know, when he got elected, I was rooting for him. Rooting against your representative is sort of like rooting for your own ship to sink. Uh, he made promises of being independent and moderate. And over the past four years, we've seen just how extreme he is. And he's a rubber stamp for his party. He's not going to bat for our community. And, you know, as a mother with children in this community, I am not wired to stick my head in the sand. I'm not wired to sit by the sidelines and do nothing. And so jumping in and essentially to raise the bar on what it means to be in public service around here. Um, for example, I don't think that your partisanship should affect whether your representative cares about your issues or your voice. A uh, representative should be responding to everybody, regardless of if they're a donor, a don donate nothing at all, um, except, you know, being a, a member of the community. And that needs to mean something again. And so one of the reasons I'm running is to give voice back to the people, to empower people that their voice matters. And they don't have to like me. They don't have to vote for me. And I'm still going to have a very open door for their issues, for their concerns, for their voice. Uh, that's Part of what makes our country amazing is we don't have to be a bunch of yes men. We have different ideas on policy, perspectives, religion, faith, what have you, how to raise children, and that's okay. Uh, so I, I'm running to, to increase the, the conversations on issues to move the community forward. Uh, essentially, healthy people create a healthy economy, and I'm really looking to invest in our community to create healthy people. Now, um, I want to just introduce, and I'll mention it again at the end, is there a place where folks can learn more about you and where you stand on certain issues? Where would they look? Absolutely. Um, my website is sarahforassembly.com, S-A-R-A-H-F-O-R, assembly.com. Uh, folks can follow us on Twitter at Yakub for Wisconsin, Y-A-C-O-U-B-F-O-R-W-I. Uh, Facebook, Sarah for Assembly. And Instagram, Sarah for Assembly. Okay. And uh, getting back to those issues um, that have motivated you to run, what uh, somebody when you're running for office, there's there can be dozens of issues and sub issues. But what would you find is where would you focus your energy? Because you can't focus on everything uh, and do a great job anyway. So you need to. What do you think is the most compelling issues that you've either heard the constituents say they want addressed or that you feel very strongly is being ignored or under uh, played. Yes, and I appreciate that. We certainly need to triage our efforts and focus. Uh, so I would say the top three areas or priorities for me are number one, healthcare, and making sure we take that Medicaid expansion so tens of thousands of Wisconsinites can have access to healthcare. You know, it's uh, unbelievable that during a pandemic, my counterpart still refuses to lead on this. I mean, how many people need access to healthcare now more than ever, and they can't get it, not because they're doing anything wrong, they're working hard, um, but with healthcare connected to employment the way it is, and with so many unemployed with our economy where it is, 
it's just unbelievable to me that we have not taken that billion dollars in federal funds. Second is broadband. You know, it's 2020, almost 2021. We have a major university within the 30th Assembly District. We're just outside the Twin Cities. It's unbelievable that broadband is still so inaccessible to so many families within the 30th. You know, I, I can't tell you how many times I heard about a family having to sit in the parking lot of a library or a school just so their students or their children could talk to their teacher. Uh, it's inexcusable. Uh, so really focusing on getting broadband out to not only the rural communities, but creating more competition within some of the more suburban parts. And third, we need to reinvest in our public education system. You know, we're still feeling the effects of Walker. Uh, his legacy lives on in legislators like my opponent. Uh, he doesn't like to talk about it. He'll run like a Democrat come election time. But if you look at his voting record, he's very quick to take money out of public schools and at a time when we need to build our public education system back up. That's everything from 4K to our technical colleges, to our universities, and really uh, undo a lot of the damage that's been done. Okay. Well, um, is there specific, um, you know, ways that you could remedy some of those problems um, that you would introduce? Absolutely. So, during Obama's years, uh, something like $23, 25000000 million was offered to Wisconsin to revitalize our broadband. It would have catapulted us into the 21st century in terms of opportunity, economic opportunity, educational opportunity, and quite frankly, public safety issues. And uh, the Walker administration and his legislators said no, and they turned it down. And they went a step further. They passed a law that makes it illegal for municipalities to offer internet as a public utility. And so what that has done is stifle competition. It has stifled accessibility. And now instead of having an internet system that runs through the universities as hubs throughout Wisconsin, we are left at the mercy of private companies that are struggling to make it profitable. Uh, the reality is some of uh, the dynamics of our rural communities are such that by the time they lay the infrastructure to get power into or internet into these communities, it costs them so much money and the population doesn't support the amount of effort. So unless the government comes in to subsidize and to invest in this as an investment in people, it's not gonna get done based on simple economic market structure dynamics. Okay. And uh, public education, where do you see, um, yeah, there's been various proposals, um, ideas, uh, usually that when the gubernatorial election comes along, we always see an influx of money for at least one year anyway, and then it kind of tends to go down. So what do you see as an issue there that would uh, most help our public schools? You know, I, I think we need to do a better job of listening to our teachers and our administrators. Uh, we do a lot of talking at them. Uh, most recently, we had GOP legislators, including my opponents, write them a letter, um, an implicit threat as the source of their funds to make sure that every student goes back to school and that their teachers, even if teaching remotely, are there in person. Uh, the message is very clear that they were not to rely on data or science or public health uh, recommendations. They were to listen to the politicians. Uh, so for one, as a elected official, as a representative, I am never going to use my position, my political power to send a letter like that and shame on my opponent for doing so. I support our administrators. I support our schools to make decisions for our students, for their safety, for their faculty. Um, but also we really need to invest in the social dynamics of school. So whether that is getting school social workers whether that is using the Medicaid expansion money to make sure that there are mental health services, particularly for our youth at our schools. You know, Hudson has a, a great opportunity. Uh, they allow their campus, their high school, to be used for mental health workers to come in and, and meet with students. The problem is students either need to pay for that out of pocket or have insurance. And so, you know, how many students don't have access to health care? How many students are in families where the cost is prohibitive and they don't get that luxury. They don't get to go talk to someone. And I can't tell you how many times we've seen a young person do something catastrophic and that cannot be undone. And, you know, there's a, a tremendous amount of trauma 
that runs through our community. It's quiet. It's behind closed doors. It's not something that's fun to talk about. And, you know, going back to your question of why run, because we need local leadership with the courage to have hard conversations and the tenacity to actually work through them. We can't just go forward on appearances. We can't just put up a front that looks nice and sounds nice and expect that to carry the day. Our children are gonna to continue to shoulder the stress of the dysfunction and it doesn't have to be this way. We can work through these issues. We can get people the access to resources they need to move past the barriers to wellness in their lives. We don't have to be defined by this and we can make Western Wisconsin the best place to raise a family. Speaking of access to resources and so forth, what, what, what's your position on how the uh, university system has been treated uh, by the legislature and by well, Madison in general uh, over the last 10 years or so? You know, it's, it's a travesty. Our universities are such an investment in our communities, in our country, in our people. And to see the what's been done to them, to their class sizes, to their faculty, um, there are still cuts. There will continue to be cuts uh, just as a function of our economy. And we cannot balance the budget on the backs of working families. So that means investing in education. It cannot be that only very wealthy people can educate their children. We have to be able to develop a community of people that are qualified to fill jobs. You know, one of the big contrasts between my opponent and I, and I, I suppose I'm probably jumping the gun here, but he's very focused on jobs and jobs are wonderful. But if we don't have people that are educated and experienced and qualified to take them, if they're so dysregulated, they're so addicted to substances, they're uh, not in a place where they can really thrive, those jobs mean nothing to us. Uh, so Governor Evers, when he was running, talked about connecting the dots. And I, I love that analogy because it's so true. I, you know, we're jumping around here, but all these topics that you bring up, they're all interconnected. And the big overarching theme here is leadership. We, we're lacking it right now. We have a follower, somebody who does what his party leadership wants him to do when we need somebody to lead, be willing to take on these conversations, be willing to have these hard conversations and move our community forward. Um. We haven't gotten to, yeah, there's other, you point out, yeah, contrasting yourself with your opponent is an important thing to do. And, um, but one of the issues you mentioned, your main in your top three is public education. So what's your position on shifting, siphoning public tax dollars and, and putting them into private schools? Oh, <laughs> uh, no, not okay. Um, Private schools are, are fine, and if people want to choose to send their children to them, that's their prerogative. But these are schools that are not accountable to taxpayers. So taxpayers should not foot the bill for these institutions. Uh, this is a huge contrast point between my opponent and I. He is time and time again voted and supported and stood by why money comes out of our public schools and into these private voucher schools that are not accountable to the public. And, you know, it gets spun and the narratives surrounding this are just, are <laughs> quite frankly, ridiculous. Uh, so if elected, you would not be seeking to expand the voucher program has been the case over the last decade? No. Uh, and, you know, I, I support people's choice and where they send their children for school, but I also support public tax dollars staying in public schools so that they are accountable to the taxpayers and we have the strongest education system uh, possible. Wisconsin used to be a lighthouse for public education uh, in, in the country and we're losing that. And with that, we're, we're losing some of our strongest assets as a community that draws families into our community, which we need for our economy to stay strong. Speaking of having a reputation for being the best in a certain area, what about our um county highways and state highway system here in Wisconsin with um, the refusal to take any action on the gas tax and vehicles being more fuel efficient, less gas is being consumed, the price is plummeting. Um, it would seem to be an opportunity to maybe add a nickel or six cents or something that would be able to go towards our roads because for a while there, um, I mean, we're currently pretty hard to fund in any road projects that are seems to be all siphoned down into Southeast Wisconsin. So how would you change that? 
I, I agree. Um, I One of the reasons I'm running is to stop seeing our funds go to Southeast Wisconsin. Uh, we saw that with Foxconn, uh, just on a quick tangent, which my opponent all but shoved down our throats as a good idea when anyone paying attention knew it was not. Uh, but no, I absolutely agree, Jamie. We need to invest in our roads. Uh, if that means raising our gas tax uh, nominally, it's a good investment. It means less collisions on the road. It means less flat tires. It means farmers have access to better roads so that they can get their work done and access that which they need to access to thrive. Uh, our, our roads cannot be secondary or even tertiary. <laughs> they, they've not been a priority and that hurts everybody. It hurts our economy, it hurts our commerce, and it makes it very difficult for Wisconsin to compete uh, in a way that we need to, to, to thrive economically. As a lawyer, former prosecutor, uh, what do you think about um, the state's uh, relationship with our, the prison system and you know, how we're funding and treating uh, criminal justice? A uh, prior candidate mentioned about legalization of marijuana. It's happened in other states. Currently, it's a state by state, but um, there is some push on the federal level. But where do you stand on that issue, uh, the criminal justice slash legalization issue? Sure, uh, Jamie, you, uh, criminal justice is sort of my, my baby and I could talk all day and you've, you've given me a few topics in there that I'd love to dive into all of them, but taking the cannabis issue first, you know, as a former prosecutor from a harm reduction perspective, legalizing cannabis is the responsible thing to do. You know, what's interesting and it's a little bit counterintuitive, but mo the most dangerous thing about cannabis is its effect on developing brains in young people. And one of the things that legalization does is regulates cannabis in a way that keeps it out of the hands of young people. And if you look at states where it has been legalized, you see a reduced use among youth, which is the goal and would like to see more of that. Uh, drug dealers don't care how old you are. Chances are they have drugs besides cannabis. So, you know, if they're out of pot for the day, they're going to give you prescription drugs or meth or whatever else. So now suddenly our kids are exposed to a whole world of uh, dangerous substances. Uh, whereas a licensed facility who stands to lose their vendor license is gonna check ID, is gonna make sure that our, our kids are, are not accessing this. And you know, from an economic standpoint, cannabis does substantially less harm in terms of our health, in terms of public safety, danger to law enforcement, than substances, even say alcohol um, or meth or opiates. Uh, in a way that it just, it makes sense. Uh, if grown adults want to go home at the end of the day and imbibe in cannabis, that should be their right in their home. I'd like to see strong laws keeping it out of the face of children so that we're not advertising. Uh, Montreal has a great system. They have stores, but their storefront cannot advertise to the public what they sell. You can tell where, what they are because five o'clock on a weekday, you've got people in suits lined up around the corner of a busy city street going, gee, I wonder what's happening there. Oh, <laughs> I know. Um, but there are ways to do this in a way that recognizes our freedom as adults um, to, you know, to take a break the way we want to. Uh, versus protecting the interests of our youth and our community and making sure we don't erode the fabric of our community. And I'll just say one last note, um, law enforcement, you know, as a DA, holding people accountable for driving impaired uh, as the law stands now is just a beast. Uh, because cannabis is illegal, law enforcement is not able to develop objective tests. And so we know people are driving impaired now. Um, and if you legalize it, you allow law enforcement to develop the tools to actually hold people accountable when they make the choice to endanger others on the road. And I actually have one more, if you bear with me. Um, we'd much rather have money going into our economy, our roads, our schools, uh, what have you, instead of drug cartels, you know, in foreign countries. Uh, the, dr the black market for drugs is unbelievable. And much of this is inaccessible to us as Americans uh, because it's in these countries that we cannot get to. And, you know, that's money that should stay in our economy, should infuse our economy. So people- and you're, gonna, So you're talking about tax revenue then? Ta well, ta well, so tax revenue, yes, on, on cannabis. So you tax it like you would alcohol. Um, but people are buying 
cannabis, whether it's legal or not. So at this point, all of their money is just going into drug cartels that's getting used to uh, for violent wars, for, you know, gang infighting, for all sorts of atrocious uh, things to maintain the, the power dynamics of, of the drug world. And, you know, the quickest way to remove their power is to legalize it. And that really neutralizes a lot of the power uh, of the drug cartels. And I, we'd see a lot of uh, a reduction in violence, uh, which I, I think would be a nice change for, for everyone involved. Okay. And that's a fair segment of um, prosecutions, at least the ones that I've uh, seen in my legal career um, that would, again, allow prosecutors to be working on more violent crimes and so forth. Um, we have drug treatment courts that are just jam packed uh, because of, of cannabis, but that's just one aspect of criminal justice. What do you see as other uh, issues to the ever rising, um, you know, incarceration rates and so forth? You know, privatized prisons are create an economic dynamic by which we are profiting off of the downfall of people. And we are, there is an incentive to keep them in the system to crank out the real wheel of recidivism because you need customers to feel your prisons. And we cannot survive as a community running off of a prison economy. We just can't. Um, you know, there are a small handful of people that will make a lot of money uh, and they happen to be big donors. So that's why we see the power of privatized prisons right now in politics, but it's wrong. Uh, we need to be investing in people. We need to be investing in their ability to be independent, to thrive, to be a productive member of society, and to plug in in the community. You know, it costs $40,000 a year to incarcerate one person for one year. You could send them to a, a private university for that cost. And, you know, it, our, our justice system is designed or is functions as though we have rational actors, that somebody woke up one morning and decided, I'm going to be stupid today. <laughs> and when you punish me, that will deter me from being stupid in the future. And what we're finding is it, it's much more complicated than that. And it is a function of trauma, is a function of coping mechanisms, is a function of emotional maturity, things that we can invest in, in developing healthy people. That's what I, I mean when I'm talking about healthy people, healthy economy. We start with these kids and we invest in our schools. We give them the resources to work on emotional maturity, to work on healthy coping skills, to get them the resources they need when they do have chronic trauma in the home, to move their parents forward. And in the tragic cases where their parents are not interested in doing the hard work to work through those issues, making sure that we're protecting those children. And, and quite frankly, Jamie, we're not doing that right now. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how blunt and candid I wanna be here, but you go on CCAP, you read our newspaper, it's all hiding in plain sight. We have people charged with sexually assaulting children and you know we're not literally giving people a, a smack on the hand and an apology, but as a former DA who saw people who preyed upon children go away for multiple lifetimes, that's what it feels like. So, you know, I, I ask people to push past the campaign rhetoric. When someone says I'm tough on crime because there's a certain letter next to my name, go look at who's supporting them, how they're, how they're settling cases, what is going on, because our community has a long history of really softballing some really heinous crimes. And, you know, I'm rooting for our local justice system. I'm rooting for our DA's office, our judges, our public defender system. Um, but it, it's it's the cause of a lot of, of trauma and, and problems that we're all going to pay for, whether we realize it or not. Um, I'll just give one example. The laws surrounding uh, child abuse restraining orders are written by, uh, are written in a way to suggest that the people who wrote them really didn't prioritize and or understand the issue. They haven't been updated in a way that reflects what we know about trauma and child abuse. And they really tie the hands of judges to do the right thing when they're faced with a child who's being hurt chronically at home. Right. Uh, and I've, I've had situations where I have judges telling me, I see it, I understand this child is in a horrible situation, but unless you want me to legislate from the bench, I can't do anything. And, you know, I reached out to my opponent and said, Hey, will you work with me on this? And I heard nothing. So I thought, okay, I'll see you in November, buddy. Um, but this is not on his radar of priorities. He refuses to take up this issue. And we as a community cannot afford to keep failing our children the way that we are. 
All right. Well, on that one, we'll have to end because we're at the, our 30 minute mark. I uh, want to thank you for coming on to the show. Um, you've got uh, two months, I guess, a little bit. Well, exactly. It's September 3rd and uh, November 3rd is the election. So you mentioned your websites and it's, um, it, it's all Yakub for Wisconsin on the various platforms, basically. Sarah for assembly. Um, and then for Yakub assembly. for Wisconsin okay. is, is Twitter. All right. Very good. And uh, well, thank you for your time. And I want to thank our, uh, our viewers for watching Western Wisconsin Journal. And I hope you can keep watching.